Hi and welcome to the show and this week I've got Margaret James. This is going to be a fascinating interview. Margaret has written 22 books for indigenous stories, actually traditional stories on tracking and hunting and helping people to learn to read in a manner that is I think is absolutely fantastic. You've got to stay tuned. It's going to be a terrific show. Hi, and welcome to the show. And I've got Margaret in the studio with me. How are you, Margaret? Hello, good, thank you. <laughs> Margaret, I'm going to make the comment. You start off, you're going to write, was it two books and end up with 22? Yes. <laughs> 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 now, these are traditional books. What I like about them, they're very authentic Indigenous stories and helping Indigenous people to bridge the gaps from Indigenous languages to English languages and learning to read. Would that be a fair synopsis of what you're actually doing? Yes, yes. And trying to capture the engagement of the learners. So, because right. without, if you're not engaged in, in the material, you're not likely to want to read it. So yes. that's where we begin. And I think it's the same for everyone, isn't it? And people say, oh, I don't get that. But you actually do, because if you're not interested in something, you're not going to read it no matter what language it's in. But then if you are interested and it is something that resonates with you, you do become engaged and you do want to learn it. Particularly, I think, for these learners, because these books are written for middle school and older. Right. Um, and I think that by the time you've got to middle school, if you're still struggling with learning to read, then you're feeling pretty disengaged from the process. Mm. So we needed to do something a little bit radical that would go, oh, actually, this isn't just another book, but this is my story. This is about something I do and something I'm interested in. So it can kind of re-engage people who might have been disengaged along the way. Mm. Yes. And, and I suppose that's mm. the same if you're related to anything. If, if we don't learn something as we're younger, we get to a certain age, someone tries to teach us, but if we don't understand it, we kind of just push it aside no matter what it is. And you found that with literacy and with reading, you're trying to teach people to read that are going, but you're trying to teach me something. I thought, I don't need, you're boring me. Mm. Why would I be interested in reading about it anyway? Mm, mm. How did you start the journey? What was the trigger point and what did you see as going, you know what, this is something I think is needed and something that you have a, a huge passion for? Yes, yeah, so I wrote a series of books called The Honey Ant Readers First mm. and that was for young learners. And I did that because I couldn't work out why these children were so far behind their mainstream peers in print literacy. Mm. When they are amongst the world's greatest linguists, these, these children in the desert speak four or five languages before they enter English. Yes. And also their visual acuity is so incredible. You know, they'll see a lizard running from you know, miles away. Mm. <laughs> so I thought, well, they've got the vision, they've got the language. What is it about the reading? Mm. And so I decided that one of the, one of the um, problems was that they were being taught to read in a language they didn't speak. So I addressed and, and about topics that, that weren't relevant to them. Mm. And so I developed those first books in, you know, making them linguistically appropriate and also writing about things that would interest them. And in going to deliver professional development to schools in remote communities in particular, but also in urban areas, about the Honey Ant Readers, I noticed there were so many teenagers who were disengaged and then realised there were so many teenagers who had reading ages of between five and seven years old, although mm -hmm. they themselves were chronologically, you know, 12 and upwards. So I thought, well, there just wasn't a reading series that was, um, you know, that, that was written for that age group that had mm. themes that would interest an older learner. So it's so like trying to that find. Was a gap. So it's trying to find subjects that are culturally appropriate or culturally engaging. Yes, that because be you know these students, if they speak English, they're speaking Aboriginal English. Yes. So the first thing we we need to do is to try and get them to speak standard English before they you know can achieve at high school. Mm. And so by giving them topics that they can speak about and that they're really passionate about. Um, you know, that gets them speaking and then of course that makes reading the text a lot easier because they know what you're talking about and yes. so if they see a word they can sort of start to make a guess around what it is because this is something they understand. They also get so passionate in talking about it. Yes, I can see that, you know, and, and this is probably one of the biggest challenges I think that doesn't get recognised. It is you come from a culture 
and whether it's Aboriginal culture or a foreign country, and you speak as a, what I would call a broken English if you came from Italian or mm, one of those, mm, mm. and then someone says, well, enter our schooling system, but guess what? We don't teach in broken Italian or we don't teach in indigenous English. Mm. We teach in this form of English. That has got to be such a block, that's got to be a huge hurdle to try and overcome mm. in the first place. Mm. I think the first thing is to recognise, as you say, that they are speaking a different dialect of English. Mm. And then you can give them the appropriate help. But, um, yes, I mean, it's one thing learning to read in a language you don't speak, but you can't <laughs> write it, can you? You know, no. I couldn't write a sentence in Polish <laughs> because I don't speak it. If I could speak it, I could have a, at least have a shot. It was really interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine who's Italian, and he said, you know, I can teach you Italian, Michael, and you'll, you'll be able to hear it and understand it a lot more than you'll be able to speak it. Mm. He said, and that'll be your bridge. That'll be your gap all the time. You'll understand what I'm saying, but you won't be able to then internalise and then put it back out in fluent Italian. Mm. He said, mm. there'll always be a gap there. Mm -hmm. Is that the same when you're coming from Indigenous English or Aboriginal English to what we would call our English, our standard English that is, I call it standard because how we teach in our mm. schools and universities. You know, when you move from your language into another language, you, it's, it's similar to a baby learning to speak. And the stages you go through are very similar. So mm. we know with babies, we don't expect them to be born and go, hi, Dad. No. <laughs> How come I've landed <laughs> up with you? <laughs> um, we understand there's going to be a process of, of yes. making sounds and, and then one word and then maybe two words which have the meaning of a sentence, mm. but they're used to it and so on. And it's very similar when you're, when you're moving into another language. And I think because dialects of English, for example, Aboriginal English, are not recognised widely as being a different language to standard English, we don't give them that, that bridging time. No. We don't give them that understanding. Mm. And Aboriginal English across the country varies in terms of the vocabulary, pronunciation and so on, but the grammar is, is very similar right across Australia. So if we can recognise the grammatical stages that these learners are going to go through and the differences between the grammar they're using mm. and the grammar of standard English, then we can teach to that mm. and, and then help them and also understand that the types of errors they're making. For example, um, a, a child who speaks Aboriginal English or Aboriginal languages might say three ant because they don't pluralise with an S, like yes. standing. So is that an error when they're reading? I argue that it isn't. It's simply their first language, if you like, yes. interfering into the, the second language. So I would say to teachers, if a child goes three and, they know that there's three ands. They yes. don't pronounce the S. Don't worry about it. Mm. You know, they're, they're more important things to correct them on. Do you find because, and I can only speak for Australian Aboriginals, the ones that I know, because they're such skilled linguists, it actually makes it possible or easier for them to bridge these gaps. Because I find that people, and you say they speak three or four languages, not mm. dialects, but mm. actual different languages. Mm. Is that because, because they, their intelligence is able to do that, that then they can bridge the gap between Aboriginal English and a standardised yes, English to be they taught? are world masters at code switching. Mm. They'll know that in the playground or when they meet up with, you know, visiting a friend in hospital or bumping to a friend in the street, they'll switch straight into Aboriginal English. I suppose we all do in a way. We, we all chop and change in terms of the way we speak. But, mm. And then when they're in, in school or writing an essay or in a formal interview, they will then code switch into standard English. So, yes. Yes, and, and they're so used to speaking many languages that they're used to flicking between Arunda and Luritja or Walpri or, you know. <laughs> so, but, you know, in a way we all do code switch. You know, you'll speak to your wife or your children in quite a different way to how you would speak in a formal interview. You know, we all mm. do that to some degree. To some degree. Mm. But it's about understanding that other language. So if you've only been exposed to your own language, for example, Walpri, and, and then the form of English is Aboriginal English and suddenly you're expected to do standard English, well, probably the only standard English you've, you've then had access to is through the teacher and maybe some television shows, yes. many of which are American English. So, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's, I think that one needs to teach um, people to read through the way they speak. And then once they can, because you're trying to get them to read, you're not trying to teach them a language. And then once they can read... 
um, they can then read in standard English. So, you know, the, the idea is for them to recognize um, that the word they're using is represented by those letters on the page yes. and you want those to match. It's an interesting point. You're teaching them to learn how to read, not to teach them a language. I love it. We're going to take yes. a break and we're going to come back with more with Margaret because I really want to talk about the books because I think that as well as being absolutely beautifully illustrated, we're going to talk about the illustrators because <laughs> they're special. Uh, so stick around and we'll be back with more with Margaret James. Hi and welcome back and I'm still with Margaret and these absolutely beautiful books and written in Aboriginal English about tracking and hunting and we left to the break with a beautiful comment. You're actually trying to teach people to read, not teach them a language and I, I absolutely thought that was fantastic. Mm. You obviously went through some challenges. We mentioned it earlier on when we first started. If I want to learn to read something, I better be interested in what I'm going to be taught or else you've got that's a big hurdle mm. to overcome did you find by talking to Aboriginal elders and being involved in community that there was a pattern of interest that they they would grasp onto that would encourage them to learn to read yes definitely um, and I won't do anything without the support and backing of the elders and mm. the students themselves because there's no point no. If I sit down from my background and think, oh, I think they'll be interested in, you know, <laughs> a day at the beach, um, it's just another book on a bookshelf. So very important to start with the elders. And yes, they were very keen to have stories about tracking and hunting mm. because they want that knowledge passed on and they feel that as more and more children are being educated in towns and cities, they're losing that knowledge. Yes. And losing the, the, the languages as well. So what they would like, of course, is to have all these books in their languages, which is another story. And then the other thing was to find out what the students wanted, because once again, there's absolutely no point in writing books that they're not going to be interested in. Mm. So we went in and I, I'd say to the students, I've got nothing in my head. I've come in with an empty head and I want to know what you want to read about. I've got no expectations, no anticipation of what that's going to be. Mm. Um, so um, the first step was that we, we took sort of books out of their library. I made some mock-ups as if it was a page out of a book on different topics, different styles of illustrations and so on, and then asked them what they, you know, gave it to them, watched what they did with it, and also talked to them about where their interests lay. And increasingly it became obvious that they wanted to read about their culture, their ancient Aboriginal culture. And then it became obvious that they wanted to read specifically true stories. We had one with a, a, a troopie that got driving through the red sand and it got a puncture. And they were on their way to a football game. They were going to be late for the football game. So Superman flew in and changed the tire and off they went. They loved the story, but they said, no, they didn't want Superman. They wanted it as it was, which would be they'd all clamber out and put the tire on themselves. It's... You, you say that because, you know, in a, in a culture we teach our kids, you know, Superman and these heroes come and rescue. But in this culture, they're going, give me true stories. And you're talking mm. about the kids now. Yes. You're talking yes. about the children are going, yes. no, 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 no. Yes. It was how it would really be. Yes. Was that across yes. the board? Did you find that yes. was the majority? Yes, I did. I did. I mean, they have their traditional stories, their yes. dream time stories. So yeah. we weren't... We weren't going to do those at the time, mm. um, but um, yes, definitely. So what I did then was, with the Honey Ant Readers, uh, my first lot of books, I've got a lot of animal cards, and I would put the animal cards out on the table and say to the students, you know, pick one or more of the animals that you're interested in or that you like to hunt. Yes. And um, instantly you could see the engagement. Some of them would pick up five or six, um, and others would pick up one or two. And then they would speak to me about that animal and about how they like to hunt it and right. they would just become so animated so passionate so excited um you know and give us a book when i was on the tv islands recently and i don't have a book about possums they were please give us a story about possums i tell you what we can make up a story and they were getting so excited and acting it and um, and so yes yeah, so we then we then um said to the students and, and got them to sign to say it was okay, their parents to sign to say it was okay, can they speak to me about their different experiences with hunting? that's important, isn't it? Absolutely. So they would then speak, and I recorded it, and the reason I did that wasn't to replicate their story, but to ensure that when I wrote the story, 
about hunting kangaroo or an echidna that I got the facts right. So this is actually how they do it. And there are some vari- variations on how you cook a kangaroo, whether you live in Alice Springs or in the mm-hmm. top end, slightly different. Um, I know there's one story so, about a kangaroo um, that described in detail how they yes. actually... Uh, cut, cut it up, it, cut it up, yes. And you had to check to make sure, but the elders said, "No, that's what we yes. want." So I went, I went with that to Benedict Stevens, and I said to yes. him, "Look, Benedict, I've been given a lot of detail about how you cut the kangaroo up, and in the book, it's going to be great grandfather cutting it up. Is this okay?" So he sat down, and he read it, and he said, "Absolutely, Terrific. we really want people to know this." Mm. So um, yes, so it became obvious to me that both elders and students wanted stories about tracking and hunting. So the elders also spoke to me a lot about tracking and hunting. And the best part of all was that I was taken out on all these hunting trips myself <laughs> and, uh, and got to taste these animals, got to look for them, and uh, amazing. And, and then I sat down and wrote. But one of the other challenges, it wasn't just the material that I had recorded, but I also had to be very careful I was getting the facts right. So I had to go to the CSIRO and, you know, scientific places to find out that, yes, this is actually what happens. For example, um, one of the, the illustrators who's, who's an Aboriginal elder had drawn the mother and the father emu in the picture with the eggs. And I thought, I don't think the mum hangs around. So I had to check that scientifically and then remove the mum from the pictures right. because mum doesn't hang around she's got the right idea she lays the eggs and then says here we are dad you sit on them <laughs> and raise the chicks and I'll go off and find another husband uh, so um, anyway so I had to be very careful that I got that okay. that I wasn't sentimental about the animals being killed because yes. that's what it's all about or, all or about. nobody would have survived you know mm. in Australia so um, yeah mm. you, you talk about challenges and you talked about you recorded it you also record it so you got the the grammar or the phrasing correctly because yeah, you talked about the three ants yes. rather than we would say yes. three ants yes um, I would instinctively put the S on, but yes. that's incorrect. Yes, now that, that's, I'm so pleased you said that because with the honey ant readers, so that, that's going back to um, 2007, 2008, mm. I recorded um, a lot of language then to be sure that I was getting the right current Aboriginal English. Yes. And I would get the, the, the children and the adults to talk to me about what they'd done at the weekend, but also to read a passage in a book and then talk about that. You know, so we got different genres of language. And then to see whether, are they still using bin, for example, in the past tense, you know, um, on Wednesday I've been go shopping. Are they yeah. still saying that? Or, or Yes, they are in the, right. in the desert. But, um, so yes, to get the grammar and to ensure that I was being accurate. So that yes. in the books, the narrative is written in what I call everyday English, very colloquial spoken English. But the dialogue between the characters mm. is in Aboriginal English with the name of the animal in a language. So obviously the elders I work with come from a variety of language groups. So I'd have to go, okay, well, this book will be using Western Ireland or this book will be using Tiwi, whatever. And then every time they mention the animal, we use the, 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 the language word. And for example, the Tiwi book, I used the Tiwi language for lightning, thunder, rain, and yes. all those words as well as the, the fish. So mm. that'll be challenging for... A child who speaks Aranda, for example, they're reading the Tiwi words. However, because they're such natural linguists, they'll only have to look at it once, hear it, and they'll be on their way. And so what I'm going wow. to do is to get the elders to record any words that are in their books yes. and then put a link on my website so that people can go in and actually hear the correct pronunciation Wonderful. of that word. Mm. It, it sounds to me that it's a huge task to do to, to teach someone to read in the first place is a huge task mm-hmm. and then to take somebody or a group of people that have several languages uh, so you've got that challenge and then you've taken it into a an aboriginal style english and then to try and create a book to capture all this in how long did it all how did you go about coming up with a system or methodology to say i think this one will work it, look, with the, with the honey ant readers was mm. where I got the first methodology worked out and then I sort of replicated it in these, but also not because I'm writing for teenagers and older in these books mm. and they've been exposed to standard English for longer. The honey ant readers first edition I put out in full Aboriginal English you mm. know, as it was spoken in the desert. Yes. Um, with these ones I haven't, I've just done, you know, so, so it's a slightly different approach. 
Um, but what I did was with these books, it, it's gone on over three years, and I just keep going back to the students and giving them giving them things to read, talking to them about it and finding out whether I'm remaining on track and still keeping them engaged, keeping them interested in whether they agree with what I've done. And they, you know, as they get to know me, and certainly the elders know me very well now, I've been with them for sort of 14 years, yes. so they'll say anything to me. But the, <laughs> but the students will also go, nah, you know, we don't say it this way, miss, you know. Is um, that one of the so, I must make the point, you brought that, don't mean to interrupt you, but you do make the point, you put the books out, in front of the children and say, edit it. Yes, yes. Did, did oh, they loved so, it. They loved so it. So they can actually so, correct it themselves. Yes, and that it. was a very deliberate ploy because, yes. you know, my, as I said to you before, my things that if we don't, my sort of theory is if we don't get them engaged in the first place, you may as well put the books away. But there are various types of engagement. So we've got emotional engagement, which is very clear in terms of the hunting. They, they become emotionally mm. involved in the story. They love it. But there's also this, what we call participation engagement. So you give them the pen, give them, I printed out 10 proof copies of the books and said, okay, we're actually going to write the changes you find. So if there's a word that you don't use, you think I've got it wrong, Mm. scratch it out in the book can we write in the book miss yes this is called editing <laughs> and and they loved it yes. and they were fantastic because yeah. they they got really engaged so of course for that i had to use the more capable um, readers in the school because obviously by definition we're writing the books for people who can't read yes. so they can't edit then yes. so i used um i used the the students um who, who were finding reading a challenge to help me with what types of stories they'd like to read about and I used the students who were at the top end of their mm. class in reading to help me with editing and opinions wow. on, on um, how the book was going and was this actually the form of, of Aboriginal English that they would use yeah. um, and that type of thing. So Wonderful. Um, we will take a break but you talked about the two different types that were helping you there and the two different mm. levels but we'll come back and actually talk about who these books are actually aimed at and, and why and the advantage it actually gives them. Absolutely fascinating. And we will get to show you the illustrations and talk about the illustrators because the, the pictures themselves will just blow you away. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hi, and welcome back. And yes, I'm still with Margaret James in these absolutely fascinating books. <laughs> now, we went to the break, Margaret, and you said to me something interesting. You, you had people who were not quite there with reading yet. That was They were growing into that or learning that. But you got them to tell you the story, so there's that emotional engagement. And then you had the people at the top of the class who could actually read. So I thought the question that popped into my mind then, who are the books for? Is there an age group or a certain um, mm. you know, group of people you expect to like, help with I these? I felt that this big hole um, was for people who are perhaps 11 years and older, right the way up to 50, you know, mm. 100. <laughs> um, yes. they, they just weren't, there wasn't a reading series that would take them from literally one word on a page to to get them reading you know, and develop. So um, that, was, that was who I wrote for. So it's really for anyone over the age of 10 or 11, but particularly Indigenous people, because yes. it's their, their stories, mm. um, who are finding reading a challenge, to give them the confidence to be able to go right back and go, this is, this is literally from the point of not being able to read at all, mm. and off you go. And so gradually you can build up and, and do it with confidence, because it's moving in very small steps. So yes. um, they're easy to move up. And... Um, so, so that that's one thing, and then the elders were really um, they believed very strongly that people in um, detention needed material to help them with their print literacy because we know that the incidence of of people in in detention who also have below um, you know, functional literacy yes. standards is very, very high. And that's across um, everybody. Because I've read everybody, the reports. Yes, it's yes. not just uh, for Aboriginals, but there is a tendency, isn't there, that they've done those studies and said these people just haven't been helped or they've, yes. they've slipped through the gaps and, and literacy yes. is a huge thing. Yes, it is. It yes. is, and there's a very big correlation. So if we can interest, if we can give them material that is of interest and that they want to pick up and read. And mm. um, the other thing is that the elders felt that if they were reading stories about tracking and hunting and being in the bush, they might also think about 
gee, I'd like to be teaching my kids that. And if I'm locked up, I can't really do that. So I'd be better off out there. Mm. And also all of this fabulous, um, you know, cultural cultural activity is waiting for me when I come out. Yes. Um, and so just to remind them and also to teach them a bit more about what is going on in the bush because a lot of people who are in the cities are quite disconnected from that. So they sort of take them back and go, well, actually, this is how you hunt a kangaroo and it's great fun as well as being a delicious meal at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> you say that to me and I, and, I, and I can see how that would inspire because one of the things I can imagine and I'm not been there, but so you can only try and imagine and you never really know, but you can go, if I'm being locked up, there's got to be that sense of a loss of hope. So when I mm. come out, well, what is there for me? Mm. So the books are giving them almost a sense of, you know, I can have a purpose here. I can mm. actually go out and make a difference in my community, in my family. Mm. Mm. Do, mm. do you find right. mm. when, you, when you're talking to the elders, that's where they were going, look, we can re-strengthen our, yes. our cultures Absolutely. through this? Absolutely. Absolutely. And they see that connection with loss of language, loss of culture, leads to a lot of sadness, a lot of disconnectedness. Mm. And they feel very, very strongly that this is, you know, something that needs yeah. to be strengthened. Yes. We, you know, I had a very quick look at the books that you're talking about, and I'm thinking of my grandson who's five and all the rest, and I'm just thinking, what a wonderful collection of books, not just for Aboriginal children, but for all children, because if we understand each other's cultures and where we're coming from, then community, whole communities get, get stronger. Mm. Can you see these books... Um, assisting in, in bridging those knowledge gaps. Yes, and that's what the elders, in fact, in the front of each book I've got that, that that's, the elders are going, we want every Australian to understand mm. our culture and to learn more about it. And um, yes, I, I was reading the book to two little non-Indigenous boys last night, aged four and a half and two and a half. <laughs> and uh, and they, I, I just read two of them and they absolutely loved them. You know, yes. so um, yes, and it's about and 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 that's also why I gave those. So I've got the one to fifteen, which we'll speak about in a moment, and then the seven sitting on top of that. And each of those seven is called by an Aboriginal name for the animal, and that was really to highlight to people who are not of Indigenous background that yes. we still have all these languages alive and strong in Australia. Yes. and it's just to sort of for them to go, what's an Ilia? And go, oh, well, actually, this is a language spoken in, in the desert, and this is an emu in this language, and so on. So um, that was done very deliberately as well, to mm. try and open that discussion. But yes, I think, I think by people in the cities and people around Australia who, who are not um, perhaps connected in any way with, in, with Indigenous people, for them to understand that this a bit, a bit about the culture and that this mm. is going on, and it does then give them that connection. And maybe when they go into class... They will ask their indigenous friends in the classroom about some of these, or or what, what animals do your family hunt, or did they hunt, and mm. and so on. And it, it also then passes the knowledge from, you know, perhaps the the students who are sitting at the top of the class onto the indigenous students in the class. They're suddenly the keepers of that knowledge. Yes, I can tell you about my animals in Tasmania, mm. hunting a, a mutton bird. Um, and, and I know that and you don't. So now I'm, I'm the king of the class for now. Or I can tell you the rainbow serpent story, which you probably don't know. Yes. And, and so I'm the keeper of that knowledge. And, um, you know, and not the encyclopedia that's on the bookshelf. So I think it does a lot of that. And I've witnessed that in classrooms as well, where I've brought out, for example, the rainbow serpent story. And when we're speaking Aboriginal language, it sort of goes, and he sing the snake. And the non-Indigenous kids are going, what's he singing to a snake for? The Indigenous kids immediately know exactly what we're talking about. And I go, would you like to tell the rest of the class what, what's yes. actually happening? And suddenly they're proud and they, it's a, their story. Mm. You know, and, and there is no way to translate a word like sing the snake. You, you, you can't put that to standard English, yeah. which is why Aboriginal English is such a valuable language. So it's a huge project and a very, very valuable one. But from a writer and from a publishing point of view, what were some of your challenges of going from concept to actually getting the books into print? Because that's a, that's a massive investment in time, in research, just increasing your own knowledge apart yeah. from all the stuff <laughs> you've already done. 
<laughs> I never stop learning, that's and, for sure. And then, and then actually getting the, the thing printed as yes. well. Yeah. What kind of a journey was well, that for it, I you? mean, look, financially it's always a challenge because I'm yes. writing for a very small market. Right. Which is probably why not many people have done it because, mm. you know, you're writing for a group of, of people aged 11 upwards who are challenged by standard English print literacy, who are of indigenous backgrounds, you know, and so on. And so the market's narrowed and narrowed. So yes. um, it's not ever going to be a money-making exercise. However, it's, mm. a, it's, a, it's a passionate exercise and a very mm. privileged one, I feel. Um, but for this project, we were very fortunate to receive funding from the Prime Minister and Cabinet's office. Beautiful. And, um, and that was amazing. And the, the outcome was really to, to deliver resources that are going to help indigenous people. So I wasn't obligated to use Indigenous artists and so on. However, we did as much as we could. And, uh, and that was just, you know, an extra boost. So, you know, there were the elders who were my advisors and mentors. There have been the students who've all been Indigenous who've been talking to me. And then most of the illustrators as well. So um, I'm going to put a couple of those yeah. illustrations up here on the back. And I think everyone will look at those and go, oh, my God. Goodness, yes. they are, they are yes. absolutely stunning. And and I don't think any of the illustrators who... We've had 12 illustrators. Mm. I don't think any of them have published before. So it's a very, you know, it's it's fabulous from yes. the ground up on every level. So, yes, the challenges are, are huge, of course, and, um, but, and, and but suppose, very rewarding. Yeah, and I mm. suppose my next thing, because you spent so much time doing this and learning this, and, mm. and, you know, for me, I'd be going, you know, and I can see the huge benefits cross-culturally, everything for Australia in this. How can we get them into schools and the challenge of them teaching Teachers. My daughter's a teacher, and she's and look, she's really good at what she does. But she'd also, I know her. She go, well, okay. So what's the? How do I teach mm. this? Because there has that's, to be a methodology in how I can get this mm, across. That's actually a very important question because if you're a high school teacher, mm. under the system of how we train high school teachers, is you're a subject teacher. So mm. you specialize in maths or history or, um, you know, English. Yes. And um, but then you've got this cohort of students who can't read and you think well I don't know how you teach people to read because I'm a high school teacher and nobody teaches a high school teacher how to teach people to read that's what primary school teachers do so um, I think it is very important where possible that the teachers can have some professional development to mm. go with the books yes. and um, I go out to schools and I love it that's what makes my, my work worthwhile is when I'm actually doing the books with the students and watching their reaction, and that's my passion. However, I can't be everywhere, no. and there isn't the money for me to, unless somebody funded it, to train up sort of 20 or 50 people to go out and do that. Mm. Um, so an economical way is to is to do some video footage, which we might look at um, you know, yes. going into the future of perhaps me working with a group of Indigenous students and, and saying, well, this is the process I use. However, match your style of teaching to your personality. That's really important. So I'm also a singing teacher and I did speech and drama or screech and trauma, as we call it, <laughs> at university. So I don't mind going in and jumping up and down and having lots of fun. And when, when, when I lose um, the attention of students to flick into singing because that always draws them back. But that's my style of teaching. It doesn't yes. mean that somebody who's got, a, but I can't draw a picture. So if you know if you're an artist, you can use that skill to mm. to get the attention of students. But um, accepting that, I part of part of what I really believe is that a lot of these students have lost a lot of confidence, a lot of self esteem. They they see themselves as failures. So we want to turn that around. That's really important. And um, so I like to play a lot of games around the vocabulary that's in the book. So they learn it orally, but also around the words. So we play card games, we do bingo, word searches, board games, any number of activities. You know, put words on the floor and, and I call out, the, the, you know, who, who's got to get what word. And they grab the words without even being aware of the fact they're having to read to do that. So you have a lot of fun around the words before giving them the book so when they pick up the book they have a feeling of success yes. uh, an experience of success um, because they've had so many experiences of failure where somebody well-meaning is sitting beside them and every second word this poor student can't read because they need to be taken back to the beginning and the book they're mm. pulling out of the library is for someone who's got a reading age of 12 yes. and their reading age is 5 um, 
And so, um, you know, and so the, the, the assistant is giving them every second word, you know, well, we want to take them back so that they, even if, even if all it says on the page is one man, they turn the page, two men, turn the page, you know, a fire, whatever it is, if they experience a success and able to read that, yeah. they'll want to read the next book. Wonderful. But they, mm. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk a little bit about the future of these books so they are successful. Hi, and welcome back with Margaret James and these beautiful, absolutely stunning books on uh, tracking and hunting. And in this Aboriginal English, that I find it absolutely fascinating. What I love is the cultural richness in there and the authenticity. And that these are actually real stories. We don't have Superman or Spider-Man flying in. They're actually how things are dealt with from hunting kangaroos to fixing ties and the engagement both intellectually and emotionally with Aboriginal people as you, you try to teach them to read so they can fit into what we'd call probably mainstream education. Mm. What are your plans as we go forward with these now for the success and the integrate? Because I could see them being integrated and I would hope they would be integrated into just mainstream teaching from our primary school teachers. And I know these are for 11s and upwards, mm -hmm. but through the school system, so we, we're all culturally aware. Mm. Well, I guess it's about people finding out that the books exist mm. yes. <laughs> and, and giving them an opportunity to do that. So um, in terms of how I do that, um, it's important probably that I speak at a few conferences about the books and that I contact places that probably have the first series of books, the Honey Ant Readers. Yes. Um, so oh, it's, 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 about, it, yeah, it's, about, it's about people finding out that we've actually done this now. I mean, of course, the elders in the Indigenous community know that, and they are, I had a message from one this morning saying, when are the books coming? <laughs> <laughs> when are they coming? So, <laughs> yes. Yes. Mm. And we, we're talking about the, the illustrators as well of these books, and, mm. I, and I've looked at some of these, for, and I'll put you a little bit on the spot. Can you remember the illustrators' names? Because yes. <laughs> they haven't been published before, as yes. far as I'm aware. Yes, that's right. So we've got Marjorie Nunga williams who is a Western Aranda elder, and, and a mentor to me um, and an advisor, I, I, as well as her doing illustrations, I also go to her and say, is this okay, Marjorie, or how's that done? Or, you know, somebody passes away, is it appropriate for me to go and visit the family? Or, mm. you know, she's advised me on every level and taken me out hunting. So we've got Marjorie and then we've got um, J.O. Stence, who's from um, Queensland and he's done, got an amazing sense of humour in his illustrations. So he illustrated a story that was told to me by um, a Luritja Aranda man called Vincent Forrester, and it's the true story of the first Camel Cup in Alice Springs. And Vincent, as a young man, was a mustra on um, Angus Downs cattle station, and it's very funny. They obviously had a tremendous time, all these young chaps, yes. uh, mustering um, um, on, on their horses, mustering cattle, and, um, I mean, sorry, mustering camels, camels. And, um, and cattle. Um, but camels in terms of this book. Um, so J.O. You know, was, was able to really use his sense of humour and uh, once again, Vincent, who's the storyteller, I took everything to him so he proofed the illustrations to make sure they, mm. were, they were suitable. Then we decided, because that we were asked so often to tell stories about other Indigenous people who aren't in Australia, um, so we actually did one book about the sand people or sometimes they're called the Bushman people in Southern Africa. Southern Africa, yes. In the Kalahari. And, of course, I'm originally from Southern Africa myself. And so I had an illustrator who um, was from Zimbabwe called Jeff Hicks, and he illustrated a story about the sand people hunting for an earland. Um, and uh, the students who've seen that have said, please, can you tell more stories from other Indigenous people in other parts of the world? Wonderful. But they particularly... I started with this group of people because... I noticed when I was teaching Indigenous teachers and, and working in schools with students that they've all seen this film called The Gods Must Be Crazy. Yes. I don't know if you have. Yes. And they loved it. <laughs> and so I thought, right, well, we're going to use... So those are the sand people, the Bushman people. So this book is about them hunting for an airline. And it's, it's, it's factually accurate. It is what they do and how they do it, which Jeff himself has a lot of experience with. I love the with, factual so. accuracy of all the books. Yes. I think that's got a real appeal to them. Yes, yes. yes. And then we've got Jesse Young, who's a, a Tiwi man, 
who um, illustrated the Goanna book, um, uh, also with great humour. And that book is based on um, my own hunting experience with an elder called Daisy Ward who lives in Western Australia in the Nanandara lands. And she took me out. And when you hunt for goanna in the winter, it's very different to the summer. So we based the book on on the winter experience, which oh. is the one that I personally had with her. Yes. And so we've got Jo, and then we've got Wendy Patterson, who did most of the honey ant readers actually. So she's very busy these days because she did very well with those books. So everybody wants her. <laughs> so she was able to illustrate a couple of these for me. Yeah. And then um, we've got the amazing Tiwi college students who themselves are middle schoolers who did these astounding um, illustrations for that story. And is, that's about fishing for a barramundi. Is that one of the uh, students that did the, um, the coming of the, the, the wet season yes. illustration? Yes. I've got to yes. put that one up because yes. I looked at that and went, well, beautiful. I can't it took believe my memories them. back to Darwin. Yes, yeah, yes, absolutely. I can't believe that... Those six aren't going to become well-known artists in their own right, those six students, because I thought their artwork was absolutely fantastic. At the end fantastic. of this, I'm going to put a collage of these arts yes. up so you can actually... Yes. So stay to the end because we're going to put a yes. collage of these because they're and well And they're young. Worth it. You know, they're young people. They, yes. they, they, they've got a long way to go and they're so very, exciting. very excited about having yes. themselves published and I will make sure that each one of them is listed in the National gallery as well I mean sorry the National Library in Canberra mm. and um, and you know so, so their names are there so when you google their name it's going to come up as an illustrator Good. so that's sort of a pathway for them into a career as well brilliant mm. so have we got everybody I hope so because I just put you <laughs> right me. on the spot. forgive me if I have did I mention 12 yeah. so they're the six students their teacher yeah. Jesse J.O. Jeff Wendy Marjorie, yes, I think I did. That's what happens when you're lying. And, and I have to say that every one of them have been fantastic to work with. You know so what? easy to work with. Could you change this? Could you make this? Sure. Sure, Margaret, here we are. You know, yes. just fantastic. One of the things I, I must say is how the, there's this consistent humour that comes, this terrific yes. humour that's through all of them. Yes. It's like it's, it's, it's part of the DNA to have a humorous side to it. And I think so. I think you're absolutely right. I find Aboriginal English to be a language so filled with humour. Mm. People laugh so easily tell stories so easily, see the funny side of things so quickly. Yes. Um, absolutely. I think that's, that's very much part of the culture. Mm. So with, with these books, Margaret, we've got the, the we've well, written 22 now, it started with two and went to 22. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, with these now, is there, is there uh, plans for a, another series that's coming certainly, out? Certainly, yes, yeah, certainly. So, so what I've got is the 1 to 15, which is the progressive reading series. Right. Takes you from nine words in book one, and gradually we add. So book one and book two are very, very similar, which I did with the Honey Ant Readers as well, because that's where you need to get the boost in your confidence. So mm. if you manage book one, and you've really not got a very big jump to get into book two. And so book one and two are actually both about the sand people. And then you move into the indigenous context. And so up to book 15, they, they develop progressively. Then that's the end of the Learn to Read series. And then sitting on top of that, yes. I reused illustrations and wrote what I call normal storybooks. So it's in everyday English. The animal name is in language. The conversation, the dialogue is in Aboriginal English. Yep. Um, but they are for people who can read. So people who've managed to get up to book 15 and people from outside who... Not, not on a, they're not complicated to read, mm. and they're, they're slightly varied. They're not all exactly the same standard. Right. But, um, so we did that. And yes, we have, because I, when I was talking to students, I got a lot of stories about mud crabs, about, <laughs> <laughs> about hunting for dugong, hunting for turtles. So definitely that's a book waiting to come out. And I have the perfect illustrator in oh. Jesse Young, because he's a Tiwi man himself. Yes. The students at Tiwi College would love to do another book. And um, it looks like they'd love to write about hunting for possums. Yes. So we, we've, got, we've got a few. And then, of course, the um, elders all want the books in their languages, which translating is a massive job. A it's massive a really job. big job because they weren't traditionally written languages. Mm. So there are very few people, relatively few people, who can write the language. Mm. And then you've got disagreements sometimes between groups of people within the same language 
because it's such a recently, you know, written form. Yes. So you've got to, you know, be very careful that you include everybody, that you get linguists to have a have a look as well and, yeah. and so on. So it does take a while. And then once I've got anything in language, I always accompany it with audio so that we retain the original sound of these languages. We don't have somebody like me reading it in the language, which I'll do, <laughs> but, but I'm doing it with my funny accent. So, um, you know, we want say, to preserve the real way so that we yes. really are preserving the languages for posterity. Yeah. And that is a challenge, isn't it? If, you, if that is not your native tongue, if any of us that learn another language, yes. we don't quite get the pronunciation. Don't get the pronunciation. And I, no. every now and again, I'll be in a classroom and I'll start singing in literature yes. or something and the students stop what they're doing, they look at me and they burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> partly because they're excited that I'm trying, yes. and partly because I sound probably very sort of Australian, yeah. English, South African. <laughs> uh, and I think that's one of the things. That I think it's the appreciation. When you do try, what I find is they appreciate you're trying. They'll have a giggle because you don't yeah. quite get it right, <laughs> but they certainly appreciate it. I've got to say, on the 22 books you have written to date, do you have a favourite? Um, well, that wouldn't be fair, would it, on the illustrators? No. Um, but I no, I, like, I think I like them all in a different way. I think that um, J.O. and Jesse's books and Wendy's have, have amazing humour in the illustrations. The Tiwi book with the Tiwi illustrations is just so wonderful because they were such young artists. Yes. And then Marjorie has her very traditional way of drawing and and of talking to me about the animals, so I mm. love it from that point of view. It's deeply, deeply traditional. And then I love the sand book with with Jeff, with his fantastic, yes. you know, African knowledge. So I think, yes, in different ways. And and it would be, as well, if if I were to to meet a student who I felt perhaps could start on book nine mm. because they can read a bit, um, you know, which book would I bring in? So sometimes when I've been actually working on the proofs. I've detected that students have a certain interest and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll start there. Do. Or, or if I feel they need that. Like, like yesterday when I was reading to these two little boys who didn't have Aboriginal heritage, um, you know, I picked out the camel cup because that's a true story about yes. what happened, but it's very funny. And J.O. is a very funny illustrator. So, so that got them giggling. And then I think the other one I did was the echidna because it, um, I also felt that it wasn't there wasn't too much sort of um, detail in the in the killing of the yeah. echidna. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, I, 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 look, I, must, I I've, I've, ju I've just loved working with all the students in yeah. illustrators. So. I, I must admit, when I when I was looking through the books with you, it was the variety of the illustrations, and I said with the, the memories that evolved for me, like the 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 coming the wet season, and that's a gorgeous picture. I will put that one up. Yeah, right down to the fish that isn't coloured in, mm. but it's just got all the markings for mm. the children to actually participate mm. and colour mm. it in. Mm. I think it's just the variety has been mm. absolutely And tremendous. I did use black and white in a few of the books, so as mm. you say, that fish, and also in the Echidna book yes. illustrated by Wendy Patterson, we deliberately put in some black and white to make change. I also made the books different sizes, and, and I've been asked why I did that. So... When I received those illustrations, I thought, I can't make the book A5 because the <laughs> illustrations are so beautiful. I've got to put them in their full glory and I couldn't yes. sort of make it huge, you know. So that was really how those landscape A4s turned, you know, uh -huh. happened. And, 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 of course, I immediately took them to students to see whether they felt that was too babyish, mm. and they didn't. So that was fine. And then, and then I also reused some of the illustrations from the Honey Ant readers, yep. not with the same book, but I would draw illustrations from different books to create mm. one. And that was just simply financially more sensible to make it the same. So if you've asked an illustrator to, to draw a square draw within a square, you've then got to keep to that shape in the book. Yes. Or if you ask them to do landscape, you know, A4 or whatever. So yep. you've got to keep the illustrations obviously proportionately to the same. Yep. So we've got we've got A5 portrait, A5 landscape, A4 landscape, <laughs> and then there's the little a, ones 150 by um, 150 size. Oh, there's so, the tracking camels. 
There's yeah. the tracking camels, and as you can see on the cover, yes. the camel has, has been um, been naughty and run under a low branch to, <laughs> to get the guy to fall off, and uh, we have there. a lot of that. And, and another ploy that we did was I noticed when I was doing um, trials with the students that they loved it if I hid something. And so in the camel book, on every in every picture there's a snake hidden, and in the echidna book, which is back here, yes. there's a mouse hidden in every picture. And, wow. and that really engages the, 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 the learners in speaking as well. The qualities are absolutely beautiful for a school or a parent or just something going, this is this is something I'd love to learn myself. What is the best way of being able to contact you, Margaret, and getting this collection of books? At the moment, the best way is to go to our website, which is www.readingtracks.com.au. You can access it through the Honey Ant Readers Website as well, which is honeyant.com.au. I will actually but put that link. But reading tracks, yes. Yeah, I'll put that link is, underneath this, this yes. video. So there will be a couple, there. probably a couple of distributors um, mm. picking the books up, but at the moment, you know, we haven't had them finished to take them to see if they want them. So yes. at the moment, the best way is to buy them off our own website where we have a little shop. Wonderful. It's been mm. an absolute pleasure, Margaret. Well, it's been you. wonderful looking at the books myself and uh, seeing that there are an, a fantastic quality. Look, if you do want them, I will put the link underneath so you can go on to Margaret's uh, website. They are, I would, I would love to see these in every single school in Australia. I think you'll find as a resource, they're absolutely wonderful. Mm. Thank you once Thank again. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on Thank the show. You. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs>